The Boko Haram insurgency has displaced nearly 2.4 million people in the Lake Chad Basin. Although the Nigerian military has regained control in parts of the country's northeast, civilians in Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad and Niger continue to be affected by grave violations of human rights, widespread sexual and gender-based violence, forced recruitment and suicide bombings. In 2019, the Nigerian refugee crisis will be going into its sixth year. Since violent attacks of the Islamist group Boko Haram started to spill over Nigeria's northeastern frontier in 2014, Cameroon, Chad and Niger have been drawn into what has become a devastating regional conflict which have left thousands displaced. In an exclusive documentary, Plots TV Africa visited one of the internally displaced persons camp in Benin to tell the their first-hand experiences and their life as internally displaced persons. Eight years of violence, 2011 to 2019. Why some are still sleeping, some have gone to have their bath. This is how we began our journey to Uhogwa, Benin City. This is International Christian Center, Uhogwa, a home originally meant for the less privileged of this community and beyond. But since the year 2012 has opened its arms to the internally displaced persons as a result of the insurgency of Boko Haram. Today it has over 3,000 internally displaced persons and we have come to know exactly what life and how life is for these people. In 2015, federal troops were sent to evacuate these IDPs to the north, but that was salvaged through the intervention of the then state governor, Adams Oshomole, and some state officials, as well as well-meaning Nigerians. Today, they are stable here, but not without challenges, of course. It's not something that one ever think will happen in this country. Every time I talk about it, it really hurts me. Um, when that began to happen and I started to relate with persons who were from those areas and they were telling me their horrible stories, there were times I could not eat for two weeks. It was it's like, I, it was just on me to do something, do something, do something, do something. And I had nothing that, I, I didn't see myself like I was capable of doing something because the the, 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 the people that had need were quite huge. There were, were so many. And the risk in venturing into such was not like just helping orphans and other persons we had taken care of before. But uh, the pressure on me was really very, very, very high. Down deep in my heart, I felt God wanted me to do something. And not doing it made me restless. You know, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Sometimes I just jump up at night and I would just be like, I'm there, I'm seeing them. And I would cry and cry and weep and weep and pray to God to stop these things. God, stop it. God, stop it. Internally displaced people are vulnerable in different ways. Lami is 18 from Chibok. She hopes to be a doctor someday and in senior secondary one. She's just about to go to her morning lessons. Her sister is one of the kidnapped Chibok girls. Her whereabouts up until today, yet unknown. Lami recalls the ordeal. The time that Boko Haram come to Chibok is just in the midnight. When we are sleeping, 
We, end, we are sleeping in Palomi and my younger sisters, and my mom also is sleeping. My father now lie down on the veranda. In the midnight by 12, we now start hearing the shoot of gun. My mom now wake my father for him to run out of the house. My dad now run away. He now went to climb a tree. When we wake up, we now, my mom now said that we should, leave the, we should leave the house, we should run through the bush. And before we said we want to come out, the Boko Haram, they have already surrounded the place. And somebody now told my father, that, my mom, that we should not go out, that we should stay inside. When we enter inside, we are staying, we now see fire. And my mom, and I now tell my mom that we should come out of the house so that the fire will not burn us inside. Mm. In the morning, we woke up. They now say that if you know that you have a child or sister or cousin in that school, that Joining us live via telephone is Dr. Helen Tete and Pastor Solomon. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, first off, um, well done for the work that you do. For the conversation this morning, I'd like to pick your brains. Let me start with you, uh, Dr. Uh, Pastor Solomon. Um, government is doing something. NGOs are working um, as well. Can collaboration as a way to end or finding lasting solutions to the situation with IDPs, can this collaboration among NGOs help to address the matter of IDPs where governments seem to be failing? Yes, this is, this is what is actually needed. When we collaborate, share ideas, share experience, help one another in the area of our expertise, which will help a lot to, to take the situation. Because we face almost virtually the same thing the same problem, issues, so collaboration is key to having success among displaced persons. Dr. T um, Dr. Tete, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, aside from working to improve the lives of the IDPs, I want to ask what would be your suggestions as to how we can collectively end the issue of having IDPs in the country? Okay, that's a huge question. Um, I think the first thing is the government must rise up to its responsibility, which is providing security to the common man in every um, community once it's Nigeria. But now the government, despite their yeah, effort is failing. We must stand as one. We must keep our voices loud and consistent. They can't close our mouth. We have to keep talking that there is a need here and they must respond to it. That's one. And then two, we would encourage people who have displaced to be integrated in safe communities, waiting for peace to return in their ancestral homes. So the, the challenge is, will the new communities allow more people to take over their land? You know, so those are issues we have to tackle together as CSOs. But most importantly, we must keep our voices loud and consistent till the government hears us and carries out their responsibility. How true do you think is the suggestion that the IDP situation may be responsible for a cultural shift, um, if not addressed? That is, children and whole families living like gypsies um, with no secure base, and they're still vulnerable in many ways. The IDPs, uh, because of their displacement, have become vulnerable in the society. And if care is not taken, we are raising a generation of people who will be wayward, who will be lawless, who will, will not be submissive to authority. Because most of them are not going through the normal education. They don't have skills. Are, there's a lot of trafficking going on. There's prostitution in the increase. There are people without education. And there are people growing up with the anger of pain, growing up with pain, Growing up with anger, the culture of 
of terrorism and violence. So it's, um, I think there won't be a future very soon if we don't rise up to this, to stop this thing now. Pastor Solomon. Yes. Okay, I have a question for you. What are the consequences of non or poor intervention if we begin to have two to three generations of displaced persons living in this country? Uh, the society will not be safe. Uh, because if, if, if they allow this to continue, there will be security, <coughs> there will be security challenges in the future, worse than if this now. And, and, you know, these are children who are becoming agitated, very angry, and some may want to seek revenge, and then you will have more crime in the society. So I will appeal to all relevant authorities to do something just to restore their community and then help to give education and uh, all because uh, Many of these children, they are hungry. Some of them are already in the streets begging. And some are being used, abused, and, you know, going through a lot of trauma beyond what anybody can imagine. So, so if this is allowed to continue, the next two, three generations, I don't know, this country will be, will be in for another thing. All right, let me, let me come back to you, Dr. Tete. I'll still come back to you again, uh, Pastor. What development have you witnessed during the time um, of your involvement in the work of rehabilitating uh, displaced persons, Dr. Tete? Well, very minimal. Um, among the women who were either raped or found their husbands were killed in front of them, we have a few percentage that have gone through trauma healing or counseling session, and they are picking up their life um, and they are, you know, moving on. So I would call that some level of success. My pain is that we still have huge number of women who need to go through psychosocial support that are still waiting. In the primary school, we have few pupils that have been enrolled and they are carrying out their primary school education. But the bigger crowd is among the secondary and tertiary institutions, which were hoping to enroll them in skill learning, skill acquisition, and all that. So that's minimal success. But uh, it's one step at a time. We have started, and we're hoping it will grow bigger. Um, currently, we're running, we're mobilizing funds to enroll 100 IDP girls to write their SSCA. Um, register them on MECO. So we're hoping that um, if that happens this time, it will add up to our success stories. Well, the same question to you, Pastor. In your time and in the years that you've been working with them, what development have you witnessed? Uh, we've seen a lot, a lot. Uh, especially in the area of education. Uh, they've greatly, greatly improved and we have been working. <laughs> For example, right now, a lot of them are in different universities. You know, when they came here, all they wanted was just safety, just to have a place to hide. But people came, and we kept telling them they have a good future, they can go back to school, they can become doctors, they can become lawyers. For this, it was like, oh, how can this happen? And after two years, I tell you right now, Many are studying medicine and surgery in different universities, some are doing law, some are into engineering, some are into different professional studies. This, this is the greatest uh, success with uh, achieved results. And then the, the widows, they are gradually picking up their like, skill of success. They are beginning to uh, have some NGO form, learn how to go, learn how to do one thing or the other. But in that aspect, it's still minimal. Yes, this is, this is, this is a big expert we have seen. Thank you very much, Pastor Solomon and Dr. Tate, for your time with us on the news. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a nice day.